Hi, 3DMJers. This is Andrea Valdez, and you are listening to the 3D Muscle Journey Podcast. Before we dive into today's episode, just wanted to remind everyone to head over to 3DMuscleJourney.com and sign up for our Big 3 newsletter. We call it this because in case you haven't noticed, our team comes up with three new pieces of content every week in the form of two articles in one podcast episode. Rather than remembering to check back with us three times a week, we can send it all to you in one single email every Thursday. This weekly digest also includes direct links to any other content that Team 3DMJ coaches are a part of throughout the entirety of the internet. Whether that's guest appearances, interviews, seminars, or courses, you will not miss any of it. So if you like hearing about all the free resources that we have to offer, all the products we sell, all the projects we are a part of, and all the ways you can get discounts, reminders, and early access to them, head over to 3dmusclejourney.com right now and sign up. Thanks so much for listening and enjoy the show. This is the second of our two episodes all about influences, which is a topic we chose in response to a question that we received from one of our listeners a few weeks back asking who we looked up to and why. This week, Jeff Alberts and Alberto Nunez are breaking it all down from the beginning, uh, discussing who helped shape their lives as coaches and athletes through each decade of their lives. So as you can probably guess, the first few minutes don't have too much to do with bodybuilding necessarily, but they definitely introduce us to their early ambitions and athletic beginnings. Then naturally, as we progress into their 20s and beyond, we discuss who got them into weightlifting and who they admired from afar to pique their interest into the strength sports and how that led to their professional careers with 3DMJ. And finally, we finish the episode with a current list of influences that has drastically changed over the past five years for both of these gentlemen. And like I said, this is the second of two of these more personal episodes, so if you'd like to hear Eric, Brad, and myself talk about our mentors and the people that we admire, you can go back one episode to episode 42 and listen there. Starting next week, we'll be back to our regular topic-based programming as usual. And as always, if you have any feedback or comments on this specific episode, you can leave them for us at 3dmusclejourney.com under podcast number 43. So here we go. This is 3DMJ Coach Influences with Jeff Alberts and Alberto Nunez. Yeah, so we started the last one. Bert, for to, to give you more context, with like by decades, right? So, because there's no other way to like do it by timelines, and um, I couldn't decide. So, when you were a child, before you were 10, do you even remember who you looked up to or who you were like, those guys? I want to be those guys. Ooh, 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 ooh. Um... Or ladies, don't want to discriminate. Or ladies. Yeah, this is the day after national. Is it no? It's International Women's Day. Right. 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 So that actually, yeah, exactly. I'd say it was actually my mother. Um, when I um, when I go back to like yeah, pre ten, your parents are kind of like superhuman. They have the answers to everything. They're never wrong. And out of both my parents, my mother was definitely the one I was closest to. So, yeah, I just, I vividly remember just wanting to do everything that my mother did, whether it be eat the foods. Are we cutting off? No, no, you're cracking me up because mine was definitely uh, like my parents were never right. And you're like, your parents are always oh, right. I'm like, oh, really? Mom was always right. And like, whatever <laughs> she did, if she was like, back when they used to write letters and she'd write letters to her family, I'd pretend that I'd write to and just like, I look in her paper. I'm like, yeah, I need an X here. I need a Z there, you know. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it was it was definitely my mother early on, and yeah, like going back to that, it's 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 it's, it's a trip because yeah, she literally had all the answers, knew everything, uh, and was like my playmate growing up. So and she was much better at sports, at least initially. Like I remember we used to race. So moms, moms for sure. Moms. Okay. Jeff. Oh wait, did we'll go back to you, Bert. Uh what about you, Jeff? How were you and your parents? Yeah, yeah like do you even remember? Well, <laughs> Not cuz you're older I, than us. <laughs> <laughs> my am Nate, my yeah, I'm getting old, getting a little senile. No, it's my parents 
got divorced when I was six. Yeah. So I went and lived with my mom. So I would see my dad like every other weekend. So I, I was definitely more closer to my mom, kind of like Alberta was. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I looked at her as like a, like a hero figure, but I think I was pretty aware of how hard a time she was having and mm-hmm. just what she did to make sure that I was taken care of. Like, I was aware that, uh, you know, she was doing something pretty extraordinary. So I was, like, kind of just watching her, you know, basically she was a waitress. She would work, like, split shifts, like, work a lunch shift, come back home, work nights, work late at night, and then, you know, pick me up late at night. So I was, like, I knew she was, like, struggling, but doing, like, never complained, but just busting her ass to try to make sure I was taken care of. So that was kind of, like... She influenced me in a sense, like, okay, I need to work hard, too, you know? Yeah. Did you know it then? Did you pick up on, like, is this you looking back, seeing, like, wow, man, she really worked hard? Or is it, like, actively, when you were little, you knew that? I I knew. I was, like, yeah, I was really aware of just the struggles that we were having. Um, There was times when, you know, she couldn't fully take care of me and my brothers. It was, like, okay, we need grandma's help and things like that. So... But, you know, she just kept putting one foot in front of the other and never stopped. So, yeah, definitely, like, I can definitely, I was definitely influenced by my mom. Um, But, yeah, as a kid back then, it was like the Incredible Hulk, Lou Ferrigno, you know. It came (laughs) on every Friday night. I'm like, I got to watch 8 o'clock. I got to watch the Incredible Hulk. And I remember, you know, the movie Pumping Iron, everybody was, like, just in love with Arnold Schwarzenegger. But I thought, you know, I'm like, no. This guy cannot beat Lou Fregno, you know? This is the Hulk. So I, I did not like or care for Arnold Schwarzenegger back then that much until his movies came out. Okay. But like, as far as, like, looking up to Arnold as a bodybuilder, not so much. Was like, I want to be Lou Ferrigno. So it was kind of like, the, yeah, I mean, we're probably going to talk more later in life. But, yeah, it's like just that uh, the way, like, Lou Ferrigno was, like, the underdog, you know? Mm-hmm. Arnold was like that that guy with the attitude. Yeah. It just didn't appeal to me at all. I like this guy's an, an ass. I, go, <laughs> I want a guy who's more blue collar to win. So that's I was more influenced by that that personality. Um so this was before you were working out, you just thought like big strong dudes were badass. Yeah, I thought I thought the Hulk was badass. Yeah. What I mean, are... he gets pissed off. He rips his shirt off, turns green, and does a crab <laughs> most muscular. I was like, this is cool. And then my grandfather, my dad's dad, like, after my grandmother passed away, I'd, I'd, you know, he'd pick me up on Fridays, and we'd go back to his house, and we'd watch that show together. So that was, yeah, it's kind of a cool thing. That was your thing. Bert, you didn't have anything other than your mom, um, which is beautiful, by the way. Anything that had like an early indication that like sports or bodybuilding or anything athletic was like going to be coming uh, up at some point or was it all just like no nah, i want to take care of my family and hang out with mom literally the whole time no I, like looking back now man like she she overextended herself sometimes she had uh, both me and my brother so two two boys and she would do everything she could to keep us entertained and keep things fun. Like she That's would awesome. actually like play, she would play fight with us. Like we would tag team. Since <laughs> my brother and my mom, we would like tag each other and then like, okay, bro, go get in there, try to try to take down mom. Um, and uh, so so I think kind of bouncing off that, I think maybe wrestling was kind of big at that point. <laughs> so Hulk Hogan was was like the man way back when. Uh-huh. Uh, it's funny you look at Hulk Hogan's physique like. He's pretty blocky. <laughs> <laughs> but he's just he was large. Not, he was a large man. He's not 6'8", though. I remember they used to put uh, down 6'8", 303. And this is just kind of fast so forwarding to recent remember times. I remember, that. well, I saw him with his daughter when they had the reality show. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, there's no way your daughter is about as tall as you are. Because that means that chick's like almost seven feet tall. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it was, it was, I think the wrestling was big. And Hulk Hogan, it's, you know, like, you know, with his, like, flag and, like, you know, the, the leg drop. And, and the, he was, like, the good guy back then. Mm-hmm. Um, that was probably it. But I think other than that, uh, I wasn't 
I wasn't too big into sports, at least not initially. Not not like before I hit puberty, to be honest. I preferred to just kind of stay at home and, and, and draw. And I think my biggest influences were maybe the Ninja Turtles at that point. Hey. Outside of, yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was a sports guy, no doubt. Yeah. Back then. What about? I was, yeah, I played. Oh, go ahead. Baseball, football, basketball. I mean, I was all into that. Like Dr. J back then. That mm -hmm. was like, that was the Michael Jordan back then, Dr. J. And then like, like for baseball, Ricky Henderson, Nolan Ryan, those guys. Yeah. So yeah, I was definitely like, I wouldn't say I was like heavily influenced by them because I, I mean. I just was athletic, so I loved playing sports, but it was like, yeah, just watching those guys do their thing, it, it was definitely motivating. Now, was that, let's go ahead and go with, like, a adolescent, like, 10 to 20 kind of thing. That's when you really got into sports, all right? I guess more so, that was, like, middle school, early high I mean, school? Yeah, I started playing baseball in, when I was eight. Okay. Um, got into basketball more like sixth, seventh grade. Was playing on teams and things like that. Um, football, yeah, I was like more towards high school. But, but it was like I was that kid that I come home from school and let's go out into the street and play football. Yeah, tag football, or let's play bat. If it's basketball season, it's basketball season. Baseball, baseball. I was like, I remember spending my whole summers like we'd go to take the ball and bat, go to the field, and be there for hours and not even go home to eat just play all day yeah. so i was that kid always doing something athletic and so in person did you have like any particular people like of those kids like was there like the high school kid that was like oh shit i want to be that guy or was it always just like the the famous ones on tv no i didn't really look up to too many kids You're like no i, I was be the that best kid. <laughs> well in high school i was like pound for pound one of the stronger kids in school yeah. and I remember at the time back then I was heavily into Mike Tyson okay because Mike Tyson was bust out on the scene and back then you know like I was bench pressing a shit ton and had this ego like this kid with this ego with muscles and I wanted I remember I wanted to be like Mike Tyson and, and knock everybody out did you get in so fights? we get no I didn't get uh. in fights but we would get the gloves and with a couple of my friends and we'd box and then record it <laughs> <laughs> well, on this camera, the one that goes on your shoulder. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, with the VHS. Yeah, and I still, I still have the video. I should, I should bust it out. I just need to convert it to a disc. Oh so my it, god! But I have it. And yeah, That's so awesome. Like, Mike Tyson, like any time a, a Tyson fight on, mm -hmm. I mean, everybody at that time stopped and and was like, okay, let's let's watch HBO and watch him fight. That's right. HBO I didn't know what kind of deal. person he was. You know that he was. Yeah, he was that dude but it was just like him getting in the ring no no robe no nothing get in there no music playing just like total warrior i was like yeah this guy's badass I want to like that. <laughs> so it wasn't did you ever like actually pursue boxing or just like for funsies it was more fun but i remember mm -hmm. at one point i got a little serious like actually i remember contacting a, a boxing gym there it's like it's too late you're too old you know, you need to start out. And you were like, what, 15? I was like 17 years old. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, Bert, how about you? Adolescent before 20. By the way, I saw the video of Jeff punching his friend. That was what? it. I showed you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you hit Mike. Poor Mike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mike that we met in London? <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, my God. <laughs> But I wasn't hitting them hard. I was just kind of, you know, tap, tap, tap. Gotcha. I don't know what I would do if someone punched me. <laughs> now that I think about that. Anyways, because I'm sure a tap hurts. It does. Yeah. The routine hits look even a little bit harder. On TV, it looks like just a jab until you get jabbed. And you're like, yeah, that, that's a punch to the face. Um, and you were, though. Uh, shoot. Um, Who were your you know, people? I'd say... Kind of going back a little bit, I, I think for me, um, when I did finally start getting in, into sports, uh, the 49ers were pretty big. Okay. Uh, so there was like a collection of uh, football heroes there. And, you know, you had your 
your Joe Montana's, your your Roger Craig's, your your Ronnie Lotts. Uh, but I think it was Jerry Rice that more than anyone kind of stuck out to me. Um, and I think the biggest reason why was just because uh, what appealed to me about him was the fact that he was willing to go the extra mile in regards to hard work. Um, he was one of the first guys that, you know, it used to be like when it was off season, it was off season. You report the camp out of shape and it was partially the team's job to like, you know, get you back into football shape and then you'd go from there. But he was one of the first guys that, uh, yeah, he decided to make the off season improvement season. And that's, that, that was the one thing you would always hear about Jerry. He's like, he, he, he works extra hard. There's no one that works like him. And it was very appealing to see him, I guess, being tagged that and then like seeing that show up on the field. And he was just so far ahead of everyone else um during that that time it was a lot of other receivers that were they were fantastic the kind of dating myself with like the mike lurvins andre risens a lot of people who they don't know who who, who these people are my quite parents often, watch football they, so i know those names but so but but they know most people yeah, know jerry they were good but yeah it was like jerry was on another level yeah yeah so but you never played me, football I, uh, no, no, no. I, I did play football through through middle school, um, and then I went to the wrong high school. Didn't have a football program, um, and uh, but but still, like just in regards to whatever I did play, that was something that I would recall. Is like, oh, you know, when Jerry, you know, runs a pattern, he finishes it hard. You know, Jerry doesn't take a playoff when it's it's time for him to block. He's gonna block as as well as he can. So I remember. Yeah, I, I used to, I, I would start applying that to my own sports. And it was kind of the same thing as Jeff. Whatever was going on, that's what we did. When it was like the NBA playoffs, we were in the basketball courts like every single day. When it was baseball season, same thing. And uh, regardless of the sport, you know, it was like, you know, usually you hit a fadeaway and you pretend you're Michael. But for me, it was always regardless of the sport. It's like I'm going to take a little bit of, of, of Jerry with me. Um so I think the yeah the biggest thing was just the the, the work ethic. I, I found that very very appealing for reasons I can't completely point out. Right. But um, but uh, looking back, it probably wasn't a bad trait to grasp. Too. Yeah, and that's awesome too. Like doing this these podcasts with y'all is seeing how early that you can see how you were like formed. Basically, like, you know, knowing what we know about each other now, like Jeff being like, I want the underdog blue collar guy to win, the, the good guy, you know, the one that wasn't the asshole show off, you know, and you're still like, like that today. And Bert, you recognizing that you liked the, because I guess right now in the past couple of years, it's been, you're one of the like poster boys for like having a productive off season and not, and using it well and like all that stuff, you know, and seeing how early you recognize that. So that's cool. Yeah. And, and, you know, the thing about Jerry is, like, he was very talented, but there was a few other receivers in the league that probably were just, in terms of raw talent, better than him. But because of his hard work, not only was he able to be as good as they were, but, like, there was a significant gap. And, yeah, I think looking back now, that was what was most appealing. It's, it's like, you can, right? It's, it's, people laugh at this phrase all the time, but you, you can outwork to a certain extent. Um and I love that. I love that idea. Yeah. yeah. Um, so before you turned 20, though, actually, both of y'all were already lifting, right? Late teens. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So where did that come breaking from, like, the decade theme? Whenever you actually did make that shift into the weight room, who were your – would you say that there was any one person that got you there? Jeff? I mean, as far as starting the train? Yeah, like, was there a certain magazine, a certain person you were following, a certain uh, person in your life uh, that thought training was cool? I started training in PE class in eighth grade on that old universal machine. That's right. I liked the way it felt, and I liked the way you know my peers would say, well, wow, he's strong. So that kind of motivated me. Um, but I also used it as a tool to kind of escape from my home reality. Right. Um, cause at the time it was like, yeah, transitioning, my, my mom got remarried and my stepfather was a little rough around the edges. 
um, it was just, you know, living with my mom for so many years, basically being spoiled rotten yeah. to going to now a, a really structured, disciplined home. It was like, whoa, that was a shocker. So it was like, wait, 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 the thing was kind of an escape. Um, but I would say like the first real major influence that I had was in my early 20s. Okay. Um, a guy named Dave, basically, when I was uh, when I was going to school in Arizona. Uh, he just had these ginormous legs and I didn't have no legs at the time. I was just all upper body. I never trained legs. Yeah. And I was like impressed by that. I was like, man, this guy's got some trunks. I go, so I was like, and I was kind of a shy dude. So it took a lot for me to go actually go up and ask him, Hey, how'd you get your legs like that? Um, but he's like, Hey, come to, come to the gym Wednesday morning, 10 o'clock. I'll show okay. you. So basically it influenced me to get more on a structured program because prior to that I wasn't really structured too much. I was just going there and just lift. Mm-hmm. So he actually, it's like when I got introduced to uh, Mincer's hit style of training. Um, okay. So he influenced me pretty heavily. And of course, once I started making really serious gains with that, and I, that was just because I was on a structure now, I was eating more food. It was just, you know, going from a bad environment to now a better, better one quite a bit but in my eyes I'm like man this is it so I was like heavily influenced what did Dave uh was he competing was he just li- working out yeah. because he liked it Nas- national level competitor in BC okay um wasn't wasn't clean and he basically told me that so it wasn't like he was trying to hide it or sell something you know yeah he just said but he, he wasn't taking it regularly it was just like whenever he competed he'd do it stop Okay. Um, so, yeah. Did that ever make you consider it? No. Okay. I, I, I've never considered going that route. I've always, you know, at times I think, I wonder what I would look like, but I would never said I was like thinking about ever doing it. Not even close. It was just the way kind of my mom instilled in me that, you know, stay away from all that stuff. And it's just, it was ingrained. So it was just, I never was ever been tempted okay what about you Berto what was the thing or the person that helped you get into the gym for for size purposes or for not just messing around see that's 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 a hard one I was trying to think of something when you asked Jeff that because I don't think my transition into the weight room was quite like a lot of other guys um I didn't care to have muscles. Like I just, it just wasn't my thing, and okay. I didn't really understand the infatuation as to like why you wanted to be muscular. Um, I think partially it's because I was like so rail thin as a kid that I'm like, there's just no cure. I am what I am. Why am I going to try to fix that? Um, and and to be honest, my initial attempts to get into the weight room were they were just simply to hang out with my friend who's a typical boy. You want to lift weights to get muscles. And I'm like, all right, I'll go with you. I had no idea that I would enjoy it as much as I did. Um, and uh, to be honest, like, like early on, like my mom was like my superhero. And my dad, it was kind of like the exact opposite. Like we never saw eye to eye when it came to a lot of things. Um, he enjoyed lifting weights. And he was actually quite good at them. Um, like really good at them. And I think because he lifted weights. I didn't want to lift weights, you know, okay. uh, I'm like, that's my dad's thing. I'm not gonna, I don't want to have anything in common with my dad. You know, that's how, <laughs> that's how teenagers are. Um, but I, once I did start lifting weights, um, I think it was the same old, like Jerry Rice type of mentality. Like if I'm going to be there, I'm going to be the one working the hardest. Um, and for sure there was probably some sort of I had some disposition to do well when it comes to to strength training, but a big part of it was just the fact that I was in there. If I'm going to do a sport, I was always of of the opinion that I'm going to do it to the best of of my abilities. So even the Jerry Rice effect kind of leaked into that. Um, And then once it got going for a while and I realized that this was kind of what I wanted to do, um, I think the next person on that list was probably probably Ronnie Coleman. Um, Okay. (laughs) Yeah, because he yeah, just buddy. looked like he was having so much fun. Like, no one has more fun than Ronnie in the gym. And at that point, that's basically what weightlifting was to me. I remember I would um, miss out on certain things that were deemed typical. Um, 
for someone of my age to, to partake in at that point in time, you know, you know, parties, um, you know, even drinking and things like that. It's like, no, I, I want to go lift weights because to be honest, I find it like a lot more fun than like doing those sort of things. Um, and like Ronnie made, made it seem like, hey, that was okay to really love lifting weights this much. Um, and that's honestly like one thing that like every Mr. Olympia from that point after, there just hasn't been a Ronnie in that regard. But um, it was Ronnie, and then, um, as typical as this, this is, I think Lane Norton was probably the first natural guy that I looked at. That I'm like, huh, like this natural bodybuilding thing can, can be cool. And not that um, we're, we're a bit limited back then in regards to like how much you can see um, when it comes to someone you follow like actual life. So we get this much of in regards to like what Lane was doing. Like he would on a forum post once a week. Um, and to see Lane basically, I think it was his first or second prep go from like, I'm 20 weeks out to like, I'm show ready. I, I found that very, very inspiring to at some point, um, uh, do the exact same thing myself. So lifting weights just kind of happened. Um, and Ronnie Coleman was probably the first guy that's like, hey, lifting weights is cool, lifting weights is fun, um, do your thing. And then Lane was probably the first guy that was like, hey, you know, there's natural bodybuilding too, maybe you should give that a try. So I think that was, that was, that was vital that I, that I did run into him at some point. That's what I was going to ask you when you said Ronnie Coleman looked like he was having a lot of fun. How the hell did you know that? Like, was this magazines? Because the internet wasn't like... Or was you, it Ronnie Coleman? The unbelievable. That's videos, that was. Uh, yeah. He did have videos. Video. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and Ronnie was just—he was having the ball. Wait, wait, like VHS video? Like he ordered no, a video, he, like online? No. This was a. Uh, we used to pirate them, but hush, oh, that was normal. Yeah. The feds Napster are gonna come get and, you. And, 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 uh, yeah. Okay. We use Morpheus. Um, yes, it, but yeah. And now and you can still here. find. You can. I was I was like into to Dorian Yates because at the time he was okay. Mr. Olympia, and mm -hmm. but I liked his physique is not the prettiest. I mean, the guy was was huge. I mean, it was just everything about the size and but what he would do every time he got to the stage, he was in shape. Yeah. And he was quiet about it, like he wasn't flashy. You know, he wasn't a talker. You know, he would, if you see an interview with him, it's like, oh, yeah, these guys are over here training probably five times as much as I am, but I'm more efficient. And, you know, he's just like super blue collar. And that appealed to me, the work ethic. It's kind of like yeah. that Jerry Rice thing. He's yeah. in there busting his ass. You know, Kevin Lavrone's like only training like half the year where, where uh, Dorian's training the whole time. Yeah. You know, yeah. making sure everything's crossing his T's and dotting his I's. That appealed to me. Um, so even though I wasn't training, let's say, with the best style of approach with hit, but that, that just that mentality and the work ethic, like, I was, like, trying to mimic that. So And same as... Oh, go ahead. I was just like, and now it's like still t to this day, I'm like, like you said earlier, I'm more attracted to more blue collar. I don't like flashy. I don't like people who talk. Um, so it's like, just put the work in and show up because for me anyways like what matters is what when you get on stage and that's kind of how like Yates was yeah um like the head down do the job shut up just get it done yeah I I um I wonder I guess like what because I think that's what all five of us have, I kind of have in common, not that some people don't, but some people really like the talkers, right? And not that they're bad people, but I think, uh, like, I, I try to align, like, at what point did that early on become something that attracted us to that? Because we've all said that, like, and I, I haven't listened to the last interview yet because it's not out, but um, just so y'all know, in our other interview, it's kind of a, a pretty similar theme. I think it's interesting. Um I don't have anything against people that are talkers. Like, I would say probably when I was a little less mature, I would be like, these people are idiots. You know, look at them, like, <laughs> look at, look, look down on them because they are, you know, it's like, the, like, I think I've written an article on this. You know, it's like, you know, I remember watching football or whatever, guys, you know, 
icky shuffle and all that kind of stuff, end zone celebrations. I'm like, this is stupid. Just do yeah. your job. Score a touchdown, put the ball down, and go. But now, like, I totally get and understand. I mean, these people are just having fun, and that's their personality. So who am I to judge if they want to be, you know, sh- you know, excited about something? Yeah, and it's not to say that talking's bad. I don't think it's that so much as we appreciate the result far more than uh, hearing about how it got there, I guess. And don't get me wrong, like, Muhammad Ali, like, I... I'm obsessed with, like, because um, I've just finished reading his, like, Life and Times book, like, a big old fat-ass book, like, last month, and the shit he said, I was like, oh, my God, like, I can't believe you get away with that, but it was, um, he backs it up, yeah, and at some point, too, it's like, and I think about it, I'm like, I say that shit to myself, it's just not nice or right to say it out loud, but, um, it's his it's his probably his self-talk it's just that he did it out loud right like i know that the five of us and any other like i guess pretty serious athlete says some crazy shit to themselves um and the people that have the balls enough to like say it out loud um like conor mcgregor i'm obsessed with that guy too i think that's awesome everything he does i love it um i think it's crazy i think it's cocky i think it's shitty sometimes and it's real embarrassing when he loses but he's a fucking champion um and, like, your love for Mike Tyson, too, Jeff. That it's, like, it's not all bad. It's just I think that we've seen so many people that are talkers that don't uh, don't back it up. I guess that's what it comes down to, right, is can you back it up? I think, if you, I mean, if you're cocky, arrogant, and disrespectful, well, yeah, it could be a bit too much. But, I mean, if it's, like, Floyd Mayweather, I mean, I would say probably a lot of it's, like, for show. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's a way of marketing. Um, yeah. But he, I mean, he backs it up. I mean, he wins. Yeah. yeah. That's kind of a, a weird paradox, right? We're like, we don't like talkers. We're like, but if you're a champion, like, you can talk. It's like, it's... I, uh... I don't prefer it. So I was like, it's not my style, but I yeah. understand it now. Like, back when I was, like I said, less mature, it would bother me to the fact that I would look, like, down on people that did that because of that. Which, like, who am I to judge that? Yeah. yeah. As long as it's not being totally disrespectful and you're you're hurting somebody else um, in a negative way. Yeah. Obviously, if you're boxing, you want to hurt someone, but you know what I mean. Yeah. And at the same time, we're like, who am I to judge? Maybe you're not judging. It's just your preferences. Like maybe you just exactly. Yeah. It's just not your thing. Yeah. So I don't I don't always agree with it still, but it doesn't yeah. mean I have, I'm not gonna like judge that person and think they're a total douchebag because of it. Yeah. And I almost wondered too if there's those those people that. Uh, again, they have to. They have to get. They have to say that shit to get themselves in that place. Um, but then it backfires. She's like Ronda Rousey, man. Um, now that she's lost, everyone's like just killing her. Um, and but when she was winning, all that talk was, you know, everyone was loving it. Anyways, that's another topic. But it's just interesting how um, I don't know. I guess how much we all favor just the, the do the work and shut up thing. But then we just talked about how much we like people talking. So never mind. I'm going to ignore all that. But that's just uh, something I think about a lot. I just think about it a lot, like where we all came from and how we all got to a place of pretty much agreement yeah. as five coaches. But at the same time, like having our different influences and likes and dislikes. Um, like if you saw me saw me talking a bunch of smack and shit, you'd be like, that's totally out of character. Yeah. You know? yeah. Or if Brad was doing it, you'd be like, that's whoa, where'd that come from? Yeah, it always. But if it's someone else, like if you saw Floyd Mayweather, oh, he's just quiet before a fight for the whole time. You'd be like, "What's wrong? What's what's wrong yeah. with this guy?" You yeah. don't like you, you're all of a sudden not gonna like him anymore because he's not being himself. Yeah, I guess that's a good point, right? Is it actually? You can tell when it's actually like you and when it's not. Not you in particular, but someone, like whether it's natural or not. Everybody's different. Yeah. Um. Who made you want to compete, Jeff, in bodybuilding? Was it Dorian Yates? No. Was it? Um, well, I went to the Mr. Fremont show. I thought it was cool, but it was my ex-wife that actually gave me the nudge to actually compete. So she was probably the, the, the biggest influencer as far as me actually getting up on a stage, but it would have been her. 
she was like really and really she supportive regretted and encouraging it in that <laughs> <laughs> maybe yeah <laughs> but yeah she's the one that kind of pushed like you can do that you know i'm like nah, i don't want to get up there in my speedos you know and then she's like oh you can do that you can do that so she's the one yeah who made you want to go though who made you even go to the show or what made you want to go to the show oh i went with my dad um, cause it was at the local show there in Fremont and it was like a big spectacle every year. So he took me and okay. yeah, I was like, Oh, that's cool. You know, but I wasn't like, Oh, I need to get up there and do it. it, was, okay. it was, I just thought, well, okay, this is pretty cool. Cause those guys were like, they looked totally huge and jacked compared to where I was. I was like, oh, I can't compete with that. Did you train with somebody back then or by yourself? Over the course of the years, it's mainly been, I mean, at times I've had people here and there, but I usually outlast them. <laughs> it's hard to find somebody with the same work ethic. Yeah. You know, and consistency. Uh, but back then, yeah, I was by myself for the most part. Okay. What about you, Bert? Who made you want to compete? Sure, you trained at that Newark 24 hour fitness, huh, Jeff? For a minute. Yeah, they're about to close right. that one down, just so you know. You might want to buy, buy that hack. Yeah. Uh, buy the hack yeah. squat? Is that what you <laughs> I started training there in like 99, 2000, maybe a couple of years there. Yeah. Bert? Yeah, yeah, they have a very awesome hack squat there. Um, <laughs> in regards to training, um, man, yeah, like, like I said, I think watching Lane do his thing was like, it, it got that idea in the back of my head. Because at a certain point, it's like, I, I've lifted weights long enough. I, I look more or less good ish right but what do i do next with this and um powerlifting i think maybe i would have gravitated towards that but there really wasn't much around and i didn't really understand how it worked to me like when i thought of powerlifting like oh you come in and you like max out almost every day or you get stronger than than the week prior and i'm like that just that doesn't sound like safe or very appealing um so um so I think it was it was definitely Lane's influence to, to to give it a try at some point, and I think for me, uh, yeah, I was at the I was at the point where it's like, wow, I did all this with my body, but I want to do more. And what natural bodybuilders did was just so mind blowing to me because that was at that point in time where like the IFBB conditioning was kind of going this way. And whereas, like, what natural athletes, they're just getting sharper and sharper and sharper every year. So I was like, dude, like, we got, like, there's this one trick we can do better than, than them. I want to see if I can do that myself, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but it was one of those things where I kind of just, I went back and forth. When it was time to cut, I'm like, no, I don't want to cut. I still don't have enough size. Um, I ended up getting really fat, obviously. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah, like, really fat. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, it's definitely not one of those kids that were that was addicted to, to fat losses. Like we kind of uh, kind of an ongoing issue, I think, with this era. Everyone yeah. wants to be a stick all the time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but like major influences at that point, that I don't think that there really was many. I, I still think like it's funny. Like when I go back to like how. Um, how I approached all my athletics. I think I was I was a bad practice player. Like I hated to practice. I hated to just like go do something that I'm just gonna do anyway. Start but, calling yeah. you Alan Iverson now. <laughs> practice. <laughs> Talk about practice. Talk about practice. practice just, it, doesn't, it doesn't give you that rush. Whereas I think with with bodybuilding with 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 bodybuilding, it's like hey, you gotta practice because you don't go from like you know, bench pressing one plate to two plates without showing up. It's not like you can just be there the day of and, and like, you know, every day kind of is its own little competition. Um, and bodybuilding just was a friendly reminder of that. It brought back my, my inner Jerry Rice, the inner there, there, there is no off season, you know, do everything you can to get better. Um, and I think a lot of it just has to do with the fact that with any other sport, um, I wasn't like necessarily always the most athletic kid, but I was very athletic and I was very crafty. And I was always like a few steps ahead of everyone in regards to maneuvering. When it comes to weightlifting, like I'm reminded of this all the time. Like I, I went to the Arnold and I was like in the in the room in the back with all the powerlifters. And I remember just looking at these huge people and I'm like, 
I am such a small dude. Like this, <laughs> and I, I remember coming back and telling Leanna, that I'm like, I'm just like, I'm so fragile and puny compared yeah. to like, like everyone has like these knees that like, dude, they look like big <laughs> from shoot all day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I was looking at my friend Chance, uh, his knees, Chance Mitchell, awesome powerlifter. Like, dude, his knees are like two of my knees. So with weightlifting, it was one of those things where it's like you're going to have to work really hard to get really good at this because you are a really skinny man. And um, and it, it kind of brought back that, that like, yeah, that romance, the, the Jerry Rice syndrome, you know, the, like, work hard, work hard. Um, and I think from that point, it was... I can't really say that I've had many like major influences in regards to uh, people who I almost saw as like partially superhuman because yeah. that kind of was the case. You know, when um, my mom was superhuman, Jerry was superhuman, um, Ronnie Coleman like looks superhuman, <laughs> um, and, and even like the command that like Lane had uh, in regards to his physique and you know showing up shredded here like twenty weeks. Um, after starting a diet, like to me, that was partially superhuman. It's like, wow, people can do these things. People are incredible. But I think from that point onwards, once I started competing, once I really started getting involved with the lifting weights, um, I, I stopped seeing people in that light. And I think all the characteristics from that point forward that I admire about people, they tend to be... Um, the real, the really human things, as opposed to like the superhuman attributes that they might have. Right. So at some point, you realize that all these things that seem so crazy have the common, yeah. the common theme of like, oh, these people just kept working. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. super anymore. It was like a product of what they did every day. That's cool. Yeah. Um. And Jeff did. If you always trained by yourself, I guess once you realized that HIT maybe wasn't the best thing after a while, right? You just wrote about that on our blog. Um, and then you, you focus on your own experience. Like, were you, was there anyone else after that that inspired you as an athlete in terms of like, oh, I want to eat the way they eat or train the way they train or? So, yeah, two, 2009 when I met these guys. Um, so, as far as the nutrition side of it. I say Alberto's probably been the biggest influence. Just watching him, the way he's flexible with the diet, um, you know, eating a bunch of variety, and then being flexible with like, you know, traveling on the go, like weekends, and you know, traveling to shows. Basically, hanging out with him, you know, he's like, okay, man, let's go into the grocery store, throwing shit in my shopping cart, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, this is crazy. This guy has no no structure. It seems that way, anyways. Right. But that's how good he was with this stuff. Was that you know, obviously he was structured for a long while prior. He knows what to do. So just showing me these types of tools, like I could be flexible with diet, um, it just opened up my eyes and opened up a lot of options. Um, so, so as far as nutrition, yeah, it, it was basically Alberto. And then Eric on the training front changed the, the approach as far as like, you know, high intensity, you know, taking everything to failure. They added more volume, less intensity. Um, more frequency, you know, training each body part twice per week. Um, so I started seeing results from that. And this is all 2010, 2011, you know, prepping for 2011 shows. Um, and then Brad, you know, just seeing Brad do his thing with, with Xander um, and how oh. he was managing bodybuilding and, and family life. And like, okay, this is all totally just 180 from where I was prior to meeting them. Um, and just having them really just kind of just having friends like that, that were that close. Mm -hmm. That's because I don't let too many people in my circle. So that was like the first time I really kind of let my guard down as far as letting people in that close. That that, that just kind of showed me like, okay, you know what? There are people that are truly in this sport to help people, not just, you know, try to make a quick buck. Yeah. Uh, Totally shifted things for me, and obviously the the 2011 season was a huge success. You know, when you go to the stage 10 pounds heavier, leaner than you were two years prior, as yeah. a 40 year old, you go, okay, that's that just goes, okay, yeah, this approach works. Right. Um, 
we all both kind of have gone into this like 2008 to 2011 kind of era so pretty close to recent um but around that time was when 3d MJ started right so uh jeff and brad i mean not jeff and brad because i'm talking to jeff eric and brad both mentioned that um i think you've talked about too jeff how berto was kind of the person who had coached the most people up into that point up until when 3d started right um what are some people that influenced you guys or, or some mentors that made this whole 3DMJ thing seem possible or like a business model that could exist or a profession that could exist or that you, you finally realize that like this thing I live could be a career, shit like that. Um, Bert, since you were the person who'd been coaching the longest and the most amount of people, like how did, um, I guess, what made you realize that you wanted to coach or was it even conscious or you just like helped people out or how did that, um, what people were in your life that helped make that possible? You know, a lot of the, the coaching, um, or a lot of my early influences came from just coaches themselves. Um, I think the most memorable coach I've ever had was my track and field coach. Um, uh, Will Matthews, who, he was very pliable to me. And that was the one thing I noticed. He had this approach for that kid. He had this approach for that kid. There was no global approach for everyone else. Um, and I remember that because, like, I think prior to Will, like all my other coaches, I, like, I could care less about. Like, I just, I just, yeah. it, they never sat well with me, you know. But Will was different where, like, he made me want to work really hard for, for, for myself, for him and the team. Um, so he, he found a way to get the best out of me and it wasn't until later on that I kind of started to put things together. So that was probably my first influence and, and I think it got to the point where he would have me come back, um, once I graduated from high school and work with the kids as well. And that was a lot of, cause I, I kind of got to be in issues for a minute. I'm like, man, this is like tough, like to, to, you know, have a, a group of girls that you're about to take out for a practice. And, like, they start crying because, like, one of them, like, I don't know, broke up with their boyfriend. Like, to me, at that point in time, I'm like, what, what do I do? Like, I had cones set up for drills and we're crying, you know? So it just it, it taught me to deal with things that maybe I wasn't all the way familiar with. And um, so it kind of started there. And then um, the weight room was also a great place to, to learn. I think that where I learned the most in the weight room was, you know, you, you start to make some progress, you start to make some gains. Like, like Jeff mentioned, you have like these like these rotating training partners that come in. Um, they often don't last too long, but you learn to work with them when when you know you do have them there. Um, so I, I kind of I got my feet wet with that, and then and eventually the internet took on and people come find you and they're like, hey, you're really good at what you do can you help me get there? Um, so like that whole trail kind of got me to that point. Um, and kind of specifically like looking at like where like, I guess 3D muscle journey like came to be in the, and where we're like, hey, we can do this. I think to be honest, um, there's a, there was a few things we were doing then and perhaps still now that I feel just like a lot of inventions, like there's a need and, and like you have the answer. So you kind of like butt in there. And that's that's exactly what we felt like. I feel I felt like we we felt like we were different. We were unique. We had a few things that were different relative to like what was out there. Um, and like, I mean, at the end of the day, like whether it be competition or business, we just felt we were better. And I don't know if the guys will say that or follow me up on that. But we felt like we were better and we had something special to offer. We had the answer to a lot of solutions. And that's why I think it was relatively easy for us to step in. And I think primarily for Eric and I, like we were probably a little bit more trigger happy than both Jeff and Brad, which in a way kind of worked out because it kind of balances things out. You know, you have these kids that are too quick to just like run straight at that. This one? And the, yeah, and they would give us like, yeah, they would uh, tell us to sometimes like, hey, hold on, let's like reflect on this, let's think about it before we actually execute. But um, but yeah, I think, but at the end, that, that was one thing I think we did have collectively. We felt that if we combined our powers, we had something that was just 
again, the athlete would be far superior than like whatever was out there. Uh, and that's, that's kind of how that got rolling. So when you talk about that candidly, like better than what was out there, and I know that Jeff's, uh, the, the website was yours to begin with. What did you feel like was better about it? Like what was out there that you were like, this isn't right. This isn't, Mm -hmm. Um, so in other words, it sounds like there, instead of influences at some point when 3d is starting, it turns into like, these are influencing what I don't want to be like, would you Mm -hmm. say it was kind of like that Jeff or like, were there, what were most coaching teams at that point doing that y'all were like, meh, that doesn't feel good. I'll let Bert answer that. Oh, okay. Cool, Bert. Because I'm, to me, I wasn't, I don't know. I don't. I think bro, it's just confidence. I don't think he's saying that there were shitty coaches. Like everybody was terrible. It's just like we felt confident that we can provide a a good a good business that probably could be better than other people's. So it was like more of a confidence, kind of like you know you're gonna try to take first place, win first place. Well, in the I show. mean, so yeah, but like 2012, when I found out about you guys, y'all were different. They're like. Um, I guess maybe even I, never, I could answer that for y'all. Is that yeah, it? I never I never coached up until 3D Muscle yeah. Journey. I was just like, I'm doing my own thing. I, I make good money at an auto plant. I don't need to coach. I was pretty, so it's like when they said, hey, let's coach. I was just like, oh no. But then it was like the more they said, no, we can. The 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 quality of information out here in the West Coast is inferior to what was like in the in the East Coast at the time. Yeah. And it was true. Like, you know, the muscle mayhem now, which is huge now. At the time, I mean, you'd have maybe a couple guys that were coming in condition and everybody else was soft. Mm-hmm. It was definitely, and they were still using like old school practices. So that appealed to me, like, oh, because I, I do like to help people. Like, you can, you can, we can help a lot of people. That appealed to me. Yeah. So that kind of influenced me to coach, but I still wasn't confident to really start coaching because I just felt like I don't have no degrees or anything. Uh, but they're like, no, but you got like 20 some years worth of experience. Okay. And yeah, I mean, if you think about it, everybody, we all go through kind of the same things. We go from point A to point B. I've seen point A to point B countless times. So I'm like, well, shit, I could use my past experiences to help me. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm, oh, go ahead. I'm just kind of like leery about the, we think we're, better than or better like, well I think it was just more of a confidence good. thing that we can probably provide a better service that something that yeah like at the time no one was there was no teams that i knew of like yeah someone's doing posing someone's doing this and that and you know making videos for people and you know things like that so there's just like extra things that we felt like that we can provide that maybe some other coaches maybe at the time just weren't doing right and I love you for always being the one that protects our image like that. He's like, I don't want to say better. Um, which you're right. You're right. We don't need to say that. But I, I can tell you all as someone who was shopping for coaches at that time that what I felt with 3D versus everyone else on, on one hand, like you said, was you, you, Jeff, saying I just wanted to help people. And and then you also said, too, that we were making videos and um First off, I mean, the first thing that you're doing that most people aren't is providing free content. Um, and y'all were early in that. You know, like, I, you proved to me that there was, that you guys knew what you're talking about because it was on the internet for everyone to see when YouTube was just starting, you know, or just being a big deal. Now every coach has their own channel and videos and free, whatever. But at the time, no one, no one else was really doing that. Um, I guess let, let's start with that. Who... Who got y'all on YouTube? Matt, I think. Matt, because he was... Okay. Oh, because he was filming in the back? We got a huge flow of inquiries from just working with Matt, and that was great, but it wasn't necessarily, I think, the demographic we were looking to work with at the time. Right. Um, So we're like, hey, we should probably put information out there, and then we're going to attract the people that we want to work with. Um, and, but, but whose idea was it? I, I don't think, I think it just kind of happened naturally. Jeff was already making videos from time to time and he, uh, his, his website prior to it being, uh, the team 3d muscle journey that you guys know now, it was more about just showcasing talents and That's right. giving athletes a, a platform. Yeah. So we kind of had 
that going, but the focus was was very different. It wasn't until people were like, hey, you guys seem to know what you're talking about. At least I've never heard this, but it makes sense. I want to hear more. And that's kind of when we started to shift in, in that direction. And there was certainly, um, I mean, I, I say it like I was very confident that we were just going to like wreck these fools, you know, but <laughs> it wasn't like that. I think I think that the well, biggest thing that, that we understood is that we, we are a team and that we all have different strengths. Uh, and that there were certain things that Eric was going to do better than me, but there were certain things that Jeff was going to do better than Eric. And we were like, you know, no ego. We're willing to learn from each other. We were eager to learn from each other. And I think that's what made us so complete. And it was something that we just we didn't see out there. And I'm not going to say that. No, I'll, I'll say it. And even still to this day, we're unique in that sense. And that like when Jeff tells me that, like, dude, my athlete is ready. He's about to go wreck some fools like he's legit ready jeff has seen like everything at this point like everything you know um and and i think that's that's what makes us unique to this point is it like we and you see this like in our meetings like that's how the dynamic flows like we all have different strengths and yeah. we all go out there and we execute them for for the team and we all certainly have uh improved because of each other because we are major influences to each other yeah i think to add to i think looking back on it i think our our approach was very different than what was probably out there at that time mm -hmm. especially on the competitive front it was it was more the hardcore approach you know do or die you know there was no talking about relate family relationships spouses any of this. Like all that stuff was kind of like hidden or not just talked about. But I think yeah. we brought it like we showcase more of the personal side of how this sport can affect all dynamics. Yeah. And so, I mean, at times I'm sure, you know, because we used to talk balance a lot a couple of years back, you know, once that was kind of kind of got died out, now you, you have people say, well, that, you know, you got to do this, you got to sacrifice to that. So it goes in waves, but. I mean, that's how I kind of see it. It's like we just, I think we just offer different perspective and different approach to what's out there. Yeah, and a another thing too, I guess I want to uh, bring to light when we're still talking about influences and mentors and people that, that for whatever reason, um, put ideas into our head or planted seeds. Um, er Alberto mentioned that 3D Muscle Journey was a website that you had started, and who how did um who poked and prodded at you to get that up because you're not uh, you're that, not one to just throw shit out there right no that was a huge step for me because yeah. i was like very, like up until that point i just i worked alone basically as far as bodybuilding yeah um it was uh i took a vacation to new mexico it was my ex-wife's uncle's uh house and he's a doctor um the dude did a lot he's a doctor he climbed mountains he's a very adventurous dude and um he just basically would do things you know just and i was more of the quiet type guy and he was like and i was telling him yeah i'm thinking about competing again and next season next year it's like coming off like a two or three year off and he's like why don't you why don't you chronicle it journey like log it and i'm like okay that sounds like a good idea so he kind of encouraged me to to start that so that's basically what I did. I was like, okay, let me just start this blog. I didn't know what I was doing. Just got some website and just created a blog. And every week I'll just track everything what I was doing. It's uh, so crazy. And then, yeah, and then people were actually <laughs> like, few people were following. Not a lot. There wasn't a huge following, but there you have people like would chime in and you know give support and they'll say like, oh, I, you know, I know exactly what you're going through or whatever. So it was like, oh wow, I'm actually, I could see that I was helping some people and it was relatable. Yeah, it gave perspective to, or just perspective, right? There's, because how many people out there, like, the the years, I'd say for most people, it's one to ten years, right, where they're thinking about competing but never do. Um, now, I feel like that's shortened because there's so much information out there of what it's like to compete, where I, I guess there's less when I was getting into it, and even way less when you guys were getting into it, like, what is this really like? Um, and now it's so readily available, but I think you guys had a big, um, 
a big hand in making that information so readily available. Like, um, well, I guess the forums too, right? The forums, Jeff's website, stuff like that. Uh, I just think it's so crazy how that's that one person that you saw for like a few days this one time changed like all five of our lives. I just think that's mm -hmm. so crazy. Do you talk to him? Have you since? Me? Yeah. No, no, nah, because ever since we've gotten divorced, yeah, I haven't really talked to any of well, the family. Right. But yeah. And it's something He's so small. He's a good small. dude. Really good dude. And a positive guy. And is like, you know, encouraging. But yeah. And of course, you know, I, I guess, yeah, he's a pretty decent influence. You know, he's a doctor, so you look up to him as a doctor, super intelligent. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, he definitely influenced me and pushed me, encouraged me to do it. Of course, I'm glad I did. Yeah. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to you right now. Yeah. Um, so let's let's go ahead and, I guess, finish with now, right? Um, as athletes, as coaches, and as people, if we could go through all through all through all that, um, Berto, what on a on an athletic level, who who do you find? Um, I guess, inspiring? Who do you look up to for, for any particular reason? Is there anyone who really stands out to you? You know, it's it's really different now. It's funny. I just actually, <clears throat> I, I have a, a poster here of the Incredible Hulk issue 181. That was Wolverine's first appearance. <laughs> and uh, I just went to go see the movie Logan. Yeah. Um, if you, like, haven't seen it, I'm about to kind of spoil it for you. Don't do that. But, uh, it just came out. Kind of. Not really. But... Okay. Um, like Wolverine is like totally like fucked. Like the dude, like I remember when the scene started, like he was limping and I'm like, Wolverine doesn't limp. Like he has a power where he's like, he heals quickly from things. Like he, he's been in atomic bombs. Like he's <laughs> gotten a bunch of STDs. He gets all sorts of things. <laughs> and like, I don't remember that part, but okay. He didn't read the comic. <laughs> but, um. But yeah, like he he would regenerate, and he began. I'm like, man, he's limping. So come to find out, like Wolverine is, uh, yeah, he's on like on the downslide. Like he's it's the year 2029. He's been around since like pre Civil War times, because mm -hmm. um, it also slows down his ability to age, the the healing power that he has. Um, but what they showed here was like a very human side. So he ended up having a petri dish daughter that like some government made. And, I can't believe you're saying DNA. all this right now. This this one's I'm not letting anything out of the bag okay. yet. But but you get to see a softer side of him okay. where it's like, oh dude, it's like he's he's human. So when I think of like the people that inspire me the most, the people that I hold like who I think about the most when I have like a crossroad, it's like do the right thing, you know. Whether it be like do the right thing when it comes to the important things or like do the right thing, like brace hard and like finish these reps on a set of squats. Mm -hmm. Um it's it's honestly like my inspiration comes from superhuman people, people who do superhuman things or have some superhuman powers, but they have a very human side to them that they have let me in it, it, when it comes to, to that personal stuff. So um, at the Arnold, I was talking to Ben. I love talking to Ben. I can hear like the guy talk all day. He's uh, like his, his brain is so unique. But at the same time, the, the part that I like the most about Ben is like the superhuman side. Once you kind of get past all the off, like all mm -hmm. those layers and layers of, of, of information, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and Ben Escrow is who he's talking about. Yeah, Ben Escrow, and the same thing with like everyone, like everyone, like even like for example, Jeff. Like Jeff is a world class bodybuilder, but he's a lot of other things before that. Yeah. And to me, it's like the people who do superhuman things, but then they come home. And they're like as human as can be, and they don't neglect that part of them. I think those are the people who, like, yeah, they they they, they sit in my mind the most when it is like time to make certain calls or push yourself a little harder when maybe you don't want to. Okay, good answer, uh, Jeff. What about you as an as an athlete? Who who's your thing right now? I you know I don't. You look can say no one. Yeah. Many, yeah. I look, don't look up to too many athletes. Like, oh gosh, they're, oh wow, I gotta be like that. Floyd it's, Mayweather. <laughs> right? <laughs> Ronda Rousey. That was it. Like, like, yeah, the money. I, don't, I don't look up to Dorian Yates anymore or any of those, yeah. people, those types. But 
I think yeah, like last night I I got involved in watching uh, an interview uh, on Tony Hawk. Oh, that's and I'm, awesome. I'm not even in the I don't even know anything about skateboarding. I have yeah. no I have, I don't even know his history at all. I just know he's like he's a badass. Yeah. And he's accomplished. So I think what really I think kind of like going back to like Roberto talked about the Jerry Rice like no matter what the endeavor is it really kind of like gets me excited is seeing people love what they do and excel at it and whether i i like whatever it is or not it's just see it's cool seeing people like reach certain levels yeah. and there's always like there's always like a passion behind it the love for it um so it could be like like for me personally like i'm not a social media guy like i don't have a passion for it like increasing numbers but there's people that do it and they're good at it yeah. And I could look at that and go, you know what? That's no different than me trying to, you know, get on stage and win a world title. It's like, that's their thing. That's what they're trying to do. Yeah. So to me, when I look at it from that perspective, I'm like, that's pretty cool that they could generate like a million followers. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, they're not doing it on accident. And if yeah. they are, it's just pure luck. So there's that, that to me, it's, yeah, it's pretty motivating. Um, Applying their like 3Ds this, to whatever. Yeah, it's whatever it is. And I think I've had a conversation with Steve about this stuff, too. Steve, like, one day we were watching, uh, I can't remember what we were watching, like, there was a musician or whatever. He was just, like, getting down, <laughs> and I'm like, he's just like, it's just cool. Like, you you, you know, I don't really care for this type of music, but that person, look what they're doing. Yeah. Look what it took them to get to that position. I was like, so it made me think. So I'm like, yeah. So when I saw that Tony Hawk, that's what I was kind of thinking when I was just listening to him talk. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh is there anyone professionally now, Bert, that whose career you kind of admire? Whether, not necessarily a athletic career, but just who you think is doing good work in the world, and and say in the next twenty years you would like to accomplish something similar. Ooh. Um, and if Jeff has anyone before you think of it, you can start. Yeah. Jeff. Yeah, I know there's someone. I know there's Not someone. Even maybe business, but it doesn't necessarily have to be making money. Like, just what do you want to make in the world that you're like, man, that person did that shit. That's super cool. Okay. I went on for like uh, 20 minutes, as y'all can probably guess. So, you guys. Um, <laughs> I actually have a. Um, uh, yeah, I'll go with this guy. But uh, my good friend, Rich, Richard Kuhn, who. Okay. Had to retire from his profession early because of a shoulder issue. Uh, he was he was he was a doctor, so he couldn't do his job because of that. But um, he's just done so much, and he's had. See, it's funny. This is where me and Eric disagree. Like Eric is like his 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 dad was like the jack of all trades, and he never kind of wanted to do that. He wanted to find his one thing, be really good at that, and and do that. Whereas to me, the people who I can hear talk like forever and ever about certain segments of their life or their experiences are the people who have done quite a few things, you know, uh, people who the Antarctica, oh, I've been there four times, you know, um, <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. I've, I've given CPR a few times, you know, the, things like that, you know, people who have just collected a lot of many different experiences and have maybe worn a few hats during their lifetime. And like, when I think of that, I think of my friend Rich for a number of reasons, um, uh, just, just the fact that he's still looking. He's, he's, he's older now, but he's still like looking to live life and like looking for that new next experience and to push himself as a person. Um, and that's that's kind of the beef I have with specializing in one thing for too long. Is it eventually it just becomes your comfort zone? Yeah. Um, so even if it is like damn hard work, like I, I like I still think I, I wouldn't be surprised. And I think you guys would probably like say like you're nuts, dude. You're always going to do this. But if ten years from now I decide that hey. You know what? I don't want to like bodybuild anymore. I want to try cycling. You know, <laughs> even if it's just for a few years, just to see what that's about. So, uh, yeah, to me, it's it's people like that. People like my friend Rich, who you know, they've they've made every every year count, and they've they've tasted all the flavors. That that sort of stuff. That's that's what gets me going. What other flavors do you feel like you're missing? Oh, I don't know. I think as, as they show up, I'm like, okay, I want to try that. If not, I can I'll skip on that. But um, I would like to travel more. That That's for sure. 
um, even though I complain about like having to leave the house because home is home is great. Um, I would like to live in a few more places. That's for sure. And maybe okay. the exact opposite of where I live now. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think I, I, I don't know. I don't know. But I, I constantly want to keep moving forward and um, just be progressive. Okay. How about you, Jeff? Anyone, is there anything in your career that you feel like you would want to tackle soon or in the next few years? And if so, who's done it well? I think my perspective has changed in the last four years. Okay. Now that I have family and, and, a, and a kid. Like, okay. The traveling thing, yeah, it's, it's great. But at the same time, I'm like, eh. I'm like, just <laughs> for me, it's just like, I, I remember when I was a kid, my mom would just always say, you know, happiness is not where you where you are, mm-hmm. um, or where you go, or it's basically the people around you. And to me, that's what I value the most. Um, so, I think as long as I have the people closest in my life and we're happy, that to me is good enough. Like I don't need, and even as a kid, I would used to sit in front of the TV and watch sports all day long and not leave the house. That I, I was content and happy with that. So I'm kind of like a homebody, okay. just my personality. Okay. So that's that's me. Like to me, I remember growing up with my stepdad as well. It was like he he always wanted to not work. He's like, I'm gonna be my own boss. No one's telling me what to do. I control my life. That was pretty awesome to see because that's what happened. He had his own business. He didn't answer to nobody but himself. So that I kind of can say I'm happy. I kind of followed in those footsteps because I get to be my own boss. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, he was very. Um, I wouldn't say too materialistic, but like money drove him. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And some certain toys would drive him. Money doesn't drive me. And that's what didn't, didn't drive my mom either. So to me, I could care less if I have, you know, millions of dollars. It'd be nice, don't get me wrong, but that's not what fuels me. I think it's just like just being happy uh, and having those people around you happy. That's what's most important to me. Okay. So what, um, what drives you for more happy? Or what, what parts of that happiness puzzle do you feel like you could be improving on? Um, and like, do you have any plans to do that? Or is there is there? My some... thing is not not allowing stress to get to me. Okay. As long because basically with uh, with Suzanne, it's like just be happy now, wherever you're at, be happy, and make that make that. The most important thing so to me that's that's what i try to do now i don't stress on to try not to stress on too much stuff yeah that's cool. it's always hard to find that like i'm happy with what i have but i also am driving towards it's just a different perspective yeah. for me because like you say if you'd asked me this five years ago i'd have been yeah i want to try to get to that world title or whatever now i'm like eh, just let me get to that damn stage and have a good time <laughs> i don't care if i win or not i just want to keep training and keep doing my thing so it's just a different perspective yeah, and, and so what drives me, I think it's just a different fuel now. Like I just love training. It that I don't need to chase a trophy or chase a title or anything like that to keep me going. So you're almost like uh, chasing data acquisition, like you do it over and over and try to get better and better, just by learning more about yourself every time, kind of thing. I've always been that way. Yeah. Well, but it used to, like you said, come with a lot of more external things. Like you needed the other yeah. rewards, and this it's like just doing it is a reward in that you're just learning more about yourself. Yeah, that and just I just like I said, well, it's a good training session, bad training session. I just I'm there doing it, and I it's a deeper appreciation than it used to be like ten years ago. Yeah. And also the same thing, same now for me is that knowing that I have these two little eyes watching everything, or potentially going to yeah. be watching everything that I want to leave a trail that he can look back on and be proud of and know, okay, look, my dad did things for all the right reasons. Yeah. And he's human. So it's like your baby is your influence. So it's an influence. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you want to make sure that you're the good example that he needs. That's cool. Um, okay. Swear. This is the last question before we go. Um, are there any, to get y'all to these mindsets, are there anything that you read, watch, listen to, or is it just like a life as it comes kind of thing? 
Or do you all have, do you guys read? Do you all watch videos? Do you listen to podcasts? Mm. Like, where do mm. you go? Like, how do you think best or learn best right now? Whoever wants to get Alberto. To me, I still come up with what I think is some of my best ideas when I'm just alone in the woods, away from everyone. Um, and what do you think about it? Like, like that's what Moses did, right? Like he went to go. <laughs> uh, he came back with. <laughs> you mean he didn't take his iPod with him? Yeah. That's 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 how that one worked. Yeah, he, he <laughs> left it at home, or he put it at least on airplane mode, um, and he came back with that, right? Um, <laughs> So, yeah, no, like, dude, there's a lot of people who went to go hike. I think Buddha even went to go hike and came back with some, like, vast knowledge, right? So, to me, that's that's where I go. I go, I disappear, I get in tune with myself because sometimes, man, it's 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 hard to in this world um, for a number of reasons, even good reasons, too. Like, the fact that when I am here at home, I'm with other people and I'm coexisting and, you know, that sort of stuff. So, when I do leave and I go on some, like, crazy churches hike through the through the Rockies here, uh, I usually come back with a very uh, different perspective with compared to whatever it was that I left with, and um, yeah, I just I come back with like excited about ideas that I want to execute. So that's usually like my it's 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 just so distracting sometimes in this world because you're you're, you're told you want certain things, mm -hmm. but sometimes you're like, is, is that even really what I want? It's just maybe something that I was fed, and yeah. that gives me just get back to. What is it that I'm really looking for that maybe I'm not pursuing and whatever I'm pursuing now is just kind of a distraction or a coping mechanism because I don't want to dig too far into that. Um, so, yeah, to me, it's it's just alone time. That's where yeah. or find finding like the most human part to me, I guess. Like it's in you, but it sometimes gets masked unless you mm -hmm. go there. Yeah. Okay. And Jeffrey, what about you? It's kind of the same. I think with this, with so much social media, like you can get influenced maybe in the wrong way. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like sometimes I just like want to go. I'll tell you this: I have not scrolled down a Facebook feed in I don't know how long. <laughs> I can't do it. Like I think I I've gone on there like whenever people tag me, so I could. But like as far as like going on the feed and scrolling down. I can't remember the last time I did it. And just mm -hmm. because sometimes I just like when I'm reading people's opinions or posts, whether they're good or even not good, I, I just is to me it's just like it's almost like a dis like you know a distraction. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to read you know someone's posts or whatever good or bad and then think like okay I need to make something that's the same or or even counter it. Like I don't want to use someone else's to feed off of, you know what I mean? I want my own ideas, my own shit. And that's why sometimes I go in a funk when I don't really post too much stuff because I'm like, I want to generate something that's different, not the same that you're constantly seeing over and over and over. Yeah. It's just So you can say, yeah, I need to be like, like Berto. I need to be like, I need time to just think. Are you a walker also, hiker? Or do you? Yeah, I don't hike. Um, I walk the weather's good. The weather hasn't been all that great. Okay. Well, guys, this was a, this was really cool to hear. Thank you all for sharing. Thank you for asking. Oh, you're welcome. I, I find a lot of pleasure in it, as you all know. I can pick y'all's brains all day. Um, all right. So we'll see you all next week. Thanks.